Our final speaker is Dr. Jim Doyle's biology student, Ms. Kristen Larson. She will be presenting on going out on a limb, clarifying limbless lizards and snakes. All right, thank you everyone. My name is Kristen Larson. I also go by K2. Um, and it is an honor to be speaking for the 25th anniversary Mancini Science Symposium. For some of you who may know, I am actually an alumni of PBCC as of this semester. So this is really important for me. This was actually a project I did last spring in 2018. So I'm really excited to be sharing this with you because I've been kind of waiting to share it with someone at some point in a very formal setting. I really like reptiles, so I'm excited to be talking to you about this today. Um, I hope after this, if you're not a big fan of snakes, maybe you will be afterwards. So we'll kind of go into that a little bit as we're getting started. I have a quick question for you. I'm going to try and trick you here. I want you to raise your hand if you think that this is a snake. Anybody? OK, I see a couple hands. How about this? OK, a lot more hands. And how about this? A couple hands as well. All right, so I, I didn't really fool a lot of you. Some of you picked up on my little tricks here. Um, going back real quick, this is actually a legless lizard. This is Anialocultra, it's the California legless lizard. This is a snake, so a lot of you guys realize that, you saw through my tricks. And this one here is also a legless lizard, so you guys are, you guys are really smart about your reptiles, so I'm really proud of this, this is very exciting. So uh, what I did last year, I was in Dr. Boyle's Biology 182 class, and I completed this project as part of the um, honors project. What I was looking at was, there. we know that there are physical differences, as a lot of you guys picked up on, differences between legless lizards and snakes. So what I wanted to look at was, does genetic evidence support the morphological evidence between legless lizards and snakes? So what I'll talk to you about today, starting off first, we'll go through those morphological differences, the couple most obvious ones. There are a lot of different differences. You can really get into the nuances, but I'll show you some of the basic ones that I really <coughs> focused on. And then uh, also we'll talk about the methods that I used for my research for my paper. Um, and I'll talk to you about, I'll show you the actual results that I was able to come up with. And I also wanted to talk to you guys about the limitations of my study, because truly what I was doing was not any sort of groundbreaking, groundbreaking research, but it was really an opportunity for me to get some experience with uh, just genetic studies and understanding genes a little bit better, and also understanding them in the context of putting together evolutionary relationships in the form of a phylogeny tree. So as you guys saw earlier in this presentation, we saw about the evolution of the human origins. You saw what was called a phylogeny tree that shows evolutionary relationships as creatures evolve over time. So that's a little bit of what I was kind of working with with the genes as I was looking at them. So first we'll kind of talk about the morphological differences between snakes and lizards. How is it, we knew long before uh, DNA evidence that there are distinct differences. Legless lizards are not snakes. There's a difference. How do we know this? So as you can see here, we've got a couple. These are kind of the three main defining characteristics that you can really look for, especially for someone that is not very familiar with reptiles. So next time you're out hiking around here in Arizona, you're not really going to find legless lizards. But if you are, especially out on the East Coast, you can find a lot of really cool legless lizards and glass lizards. So I do encourage you, if you're out, to take a look at that. We have a lot of snakes here in Arizona, though, too. So these are some of the things you can also pick up on and watch for if you do see a snake. So with lizards, as many of you know, especially as young children, if you've ever chased lizards or tried to catch them, they can drop their tail. This is called caudal autotomy. This is a defining characteristic of lizards. Um, there are exceptions to the rule. I won't go into it too much, but basically um, there are some lizards that don't drop their tails. Gila monsters, for example. So if you see Gila monster out, don't touch it. It's illegal, but yeah, they are protected, but they will not drop their tail. So theoretically, if you were legally allowed to grab a Gila monster, don't do it. Uh, they would not drop their tail. So there are some exceptions to the rules, but when we're looking at these legless lizards that I was analyzing, this is one of the defining characteristics that differentiates them from snakes. There are no snakes that drop their tails, as far as I'm aware. I believe all snakes lack this ability entirely. Lizards also have eyelids, just like you and I. They have an upper and lower eyelid they can close, so when they're sleeping, they close their eyes. Snakes don't have this. So snakes actually, at some point in time, evolutionarily speaking, they had eyelids. Those two eyelids closed and became a translucent membrane. So now they're looking through what used to be their eyelids, but is now just a specialized scale that gets shed with their skin. So it's 
Definitely something, if you look at it, you're not gonna say, oh, that has eyelids. They can't close their eyes. So when they're sleeping, their eyes are still open. And sometimes it can be a little bit creepy. If you, any of you have pet snakes at home, you know it's kind of hard to tell sometimes whether they're awake or asleep. And also external ears. So as you can see in this image here, we have a, a legless lizard that has, you can see a very clear external ear opening. So when you're looking at that, that is their ear. They're not like mammals, they don't have pinnae or ear flaps, but they do have that external opening that leads directly to the tympanic membrane. Snakes lack this. Snakes, as many of you know, snakes can't feel. They technically can hear, but they don't have an external opening for their ears. They still possess the internal uh, capacity to hear things. That's how they sense and feel vibrations on the ground, but they're not gonna have that external hole or opening that you're gonna see. All right, so going into the methods, this is a lot of information, this particular slide, so I don't expect you to really look at it in its entirety, but basically what I did was I found, uh, I, there's a paper that's already out there that shows all of squamata. Squamata is the uh, collection of snakes and lizards. They are evolutionarily very closely related, um, and snakes are in a way basically like those lizards, but we won't go into the details there. This was, this entire image here, is the overall phylogeny of squamata, snakes and lizards, all the way down to the species level. There were over 25 images because this was the overview and then they go more and more in depth for each section. So as you can see, there are different, there's geckos, there's skinks, there's uh, lacertids, which are like your wall lizards. There are anglomorphs, so anglomorphs is colored. It's a little bit difficult to see maybe on the presentation, but anglomorphs, that's the um, clade where my legless lizards are located that I was particularly looking at. Then there's also iguanas, and then at the very bottom we have snakes. So as you can see, there is a very big gap here where those legless lizards fall. Um, and this research has already been done. This was published in 2013. And since then it's been revised, but it includes over 4,000 species of snakes and lizards. There are a lot of these guys out there. So they really did a lot of work to categorize and characterize, and they used a lot of information and had a lot more access to really cool tools that I didn't have access to. So what I was kind of doing was sort of taking theirs and using them as a reference. Could I sort of re recreate using my own little scope of what I was looking for? Can I sort of recreate a similar phylogeny tree that might show these kinds of trends? Some of the lizards that I included in my study, so as far as the legless lizards go, basically I chose these based on availability. I was looking at GenBank. GenBank is free and open source. Anyone can access it if you just know where to go and what to look for. It has a lot of genetic information. Um, the, hu the entire human genome has been sequenced, but when it comes to snakes and lizards, there are over 4,000 species. We do not have every single gene analyzed. So there were only some that were available, and not all species of legless lizards were available. So this is what I had to work with. We were looking at Ophisaurus ventralis is the eastern glass lizard, Ophisaurus attenuatus, which is a slender glass lizard. Um, there's also Pseudopus apotus. It used to be within the Ophisaurus genus, but it has been since recategorized. Um, that's the European Opalosus glass lizard. You're gonna find those uh, over in Russia. You won't find those here. Um, and Aniella pultra, as I mentioned earlier, the California legless lizard. So these are the ones that I was able to find that were available through GenBank that were free and open source. There were genes that I looked at. So in the original Pyron et al. paper 2013, they looked at a lot of different genes. They had, and they were doing their own genome sequencing. So they were able to, they worked with the lab, so they were able to just say, we need that gene. We're gonna get that gene for this many species. And they, they had over 20 genes that they were working with. So they had quite a huge scope. What I had again was just what was available to me. And I had to find, the criteria was I needed a gene that was available in at least two of the legless lizards and then also in a variety of different uh, other lizards and also snakes so that I could compare them. So I looked at the CELT, the selenoprotein T uh, intron. For those of you who haven't taken genetics yet, an intron does not code for any proteins as a part of the gene sequence. It doesn't actually really do anything. It's basically a placeholder that's associated with that gene. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that was a non-coding gene that I looked at. I also looked at R35, which codes for a GCPR G protein coupled receptor. Um, those are involved, uh, that protein that it codes for is involved in intracellular communication. And then the RAG1 gene, uh, when, I was, when I was first doing this paper, I actually didn't know what this was, but now that I've taken an immunology class since then, this RAG1 gene is involved in the development of B cells and allowing them to create antibodies in response to pathogens or vaccination. So it's really cool, I can talk about, 
whole lecture on that. It's really interesting. But these were the three that I had access to. So the, the bottom two, R35 and RIV1, they do code for proteins. So again, I'll talk a little bit more about why I kind of have a difference there. So as far as my results go, I did create basically phylogeny trees. So what I did was I took the genetic information. I had to reformat it a little bit. I took the genes from GenMate, and then I stuck them into uh, the Clustal Omega program, which again, also free and open source, anyone can use this. And I created my own phylogeny trees and then compared them back to that original Higher Net All paper to see if it was following the general trends. So this first one here, this is the Celt Intron. I color coded it so it's a little bit easier to see. Basically what we're looking at is the yellow are the legless lizards, blue are other legged lizards, and green are snakes. So what we're seeing here is that we have, and it's difficult to see, I don't know if you're able to read, the very bottom where the yellow is located, those are anguid lizards. And then we have rattlesnakes, the only, the one, one of the limitations for this one was the only snakes that had this intron available that was sequenced were rattlesnakes. There were no other snake species that I was able to access. Um, so those, the only snakes in, included in this one were rattlesnakes. And then at the very top you see skinks. Um, so again, another limitation, I didn't have the full scope of a lot of lizards. Introns are not as well sequenced in, on GenBank. So what you can see here is it looks like it's kind of pairing, it did say, okay, yes, they're with lizards down here, um, but they're closer to snakes than they are to snakes. So basically is what we're seeing. With the R35 gene, what we found was this one actually distinctly split lizards and snakes. And this was kind of what I was looking for. But what's interesting about this is it does not follow evolutionary trends. Like I mentioned, snakes are basically a form of very, very specialized legless lizard, but they're not the legless lizards that we see today. They might have looked like that at one point, but they're very different now. Um, and so what we're seeing with this is we see this clear distinction, but I'll kind of talk a little bit more later about why this isn't evolutionarily correct. Um, so again, this was the R35 that does code for that GCPR protein. Um, and again, this one has, you can see a lot more green. There were a lot more snakes that have this protein that had been sequenced. And so I was able to look at a couple of different types of snakes. There are many different kinds of snakes, of course, as you know. Um, so I was able to get a, a wider variety of that. And then last but not least, I have the RAG1 gene. So again, this is also a protein coding gene uh, that gets turned on in your immune cells for their development. So for this one, what we're seeing, we're not seeing that clear distinct split from the very beginning between snakes and lizards, but what we are seeing is that we do still see the anglomorph lizards at the bottom, so that's where those legless lizards that I was interested in, they are still paired with their other anglomorph legged lizard, um, and then they're closer to iguanas and the geckos, and then at the very top you have snakes and skinks, so those were kind of separated that way. But snakes, um, they did kind of distinctly get grouped together. So, what does this really mean? So basically when I was looking at these, there's a couple different things that come up. It's kind of difficult, like I mentioned, to tell. But we're, initially you want to say, oh look, it split snakes and lizards, great. But that's not necessarily what's evolutionarily true. Um, so what I found was that the, the salt intron, the one that does not code for a protein, was actually the most accurate. Um, and the reason probably for that is because uh, as Dr. Boyle was guiding me through this project, he encouraged me to find at least one intron, even as difficult as it was, because there was not a lot of people out there, they're not facing the same evolutionary pressures that genes that code for proteins do. So if you guys know uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest, if something has a better functioning pro protein than another, that will get selected for. So introns aren't being selected for in that kind of a sense. So the intron maybe is more accurate for that reason. And then the reg, the R31 and reg1, they were still okay. It still supports the basic question of are legless lizards truly lizards and not snakes. So all three of these do support that. They're all a little bit different in how well they support that and also how well they fit with the actual evolutionary uh, history of squamata, snakes and lizards. Um, but they kind of vary in their capabilities of what I was able to access through GenBank. So basically there were a lot of limitations with this study. As I mentioned earlier, this was more just kind of a self-study for me to get familiar with genetic analyses and also with producing my own phylogeny trees. Uh, so trying to develop those evolutionary relationships. And as you can see, there were a lot of variations. You can kind of manipulate it just depending um, on what species you include, what genes you're looking at, things like that. There was a lot of limited taxon sampling, as I mentioned. I wasn't able to find 
as many species as I wanted to for that intron. Would have been more ideal to have more species just overall for all three of them. Also would have been ideal to include more genes. Maybe if I could have found more introns to figure out, hey, is it really the introns always that are more accurate than the protein coding genes, et cetera, et cetera. So what could I look at? If ideally, I would have liked to look at more uh, genes out there. Um, and there just wasn't a whole lot available. Um, also, that the fact that I was looking at coding and not coding genes in and of itself, can we really compare them? It's hard to say. Are we comparing apples and oranges, or is this something that we can actually say, you know, can we compare this? Is there a way that we can combine these? So in true phylogeny trees, they're combining things, and they're able to say, okay, we have different genes, but now we're combining our analyses. So maybe there would be a way to do that. So just, I didn't use any kind of statistical analysis on this to determine how accurate these are, basically. So in a true study, like in the Pyronet all, they were using um, Bayesian indexing and maximum, uh, maximum likelihood statistical analyses to determine how accurate their studies actually were. Um, there also are other types of legless lizards. I didn't mention this before. I was just focused in on anglomorph legless lizards, but there are also divaminate um, and a couple others. So I wasn't considering those kinds of legless lizards. I really just focused on, in on anglomorphs. Those were kind of the ones I was interested in. So those are the ones that we're going to see the divaminate look a little bit more like worms. I was looking more at what ones could potentially get confused for snakes on a physical level. Uh, and with that, I do want to thank a couple of people for allowing me the opportunities to speak today. <laughs> this is actually Dr. Grande holding uh, my boa constrictor. Her name is H.B. Avarna, so she could meet her. Um, and Dr. Doyle, of course, for advising me. Dr. Grande was my physics teacher when I was here last year, and she was the one who invited me to speak. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Doyle, too, because he helped me with this project and helped to guide me. He was the one that inspired this from the very beginning. And on the very far side, I want to thank uh, Brennan Larson, my husband, for helping me and supporting me, not just through school, but he also made my poster board for the honors uh, presentation. <laughs> He's a lot more creative than I am, so, and he was able to be here today, so thank you very much, Brennan. <laughs> So the question was, is the reg one slide suggesting that all legless lizards are anglomorpha? Yes, the, the legless lizards I was looking at are all anglomorpha. Um, that was just by my choice. There are divaminate, sorry, there are divamids, which I did not include in this study. So actually that would be one of the potential future possibilities would be to see where would each of these three genes place those. Um, so this, this is showing that, but it's by design of the experiment. Uh, let's see. I know you had another part to your question, what was it? So the, the question was, what evolutionary pressures would guide leglessness? I'm glad that you asked this. Fossorial lifestyle. So lizards become legless when they start to burrow more and they start to live underground. And that's true of snakes as well. Um, snakes originated, their, their ancestor, their common ancestor with lizards started out, the reason they became legless was because they started living underground in burrows and legs are not really needed when you're just slithering through soil. So what happened was, Snakes became fossorial, and then now, nowadays, obviously, that's not just the case. We have sea snakes, we have snakes that are arboreal, we have snakes that are all over the place. That's because they eventually radiated back out into those environments. They did not start out that way, though. So it's the same thing. They're basically, I guess you could think of it as legless lizards re-evolving into a new type of snake, potentially. But we'll have to wait and see what those species end up radiating into. Other questions? Yes. So the question was, morphologically speaking, is there evidence of the fact that these legless lizards used to possess limbs? And the answer is yes. Um, I didn't look directly. I, I don't have a work with these species directly. I know Phoenix herb actually has, and I've worked with them a little bit, one of them. But in snakes, actually, there is also evidence. Some snakes possess spurs still, which is the uh, remnants of hind limbs. And they, you can actually, on an x-ray, sometimes you can see the remnants of the pelvic girdle. 
Um, and legless lizards, I think it just depends on which species you're looking at, but you would probably find the same thing, skeletally speaking, um, whether there be evidence of uh, maybe a reduced structure, but it's still there, or something along those lines. I don't know, I haven't looked into that directly, but my guess is would be yes, because we still see it in snakes too. Other questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, um, your book is in the blocks. So the question was. Oh yes. Yeah, so the question is, geckos and skinks seem to be distinctive from other species, including snakes, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and from other lizards, yes. So I'm gonna actually need to back up a little. So this is going back, this is actually the original, so the Pyronet all, um, and they have revised this, but I, I think it was just, they didn't redo really the whole thing, they just, I think, did an addendum, basically, I'd have to double check. But geckos actually are one of the more ancient lineages, and then you have skinks branching off, so geckos were one of the first to branch, where there was a split, and then skinks. So that's why, I think, why they're splitting, and they seem to be so distinct from other lizards and from snakes as well. Um, and also, it's funny that you mentioned that, the geckos also don't have eyelids, I think that was convergent. Evolution. They don't, as many of you know, uh, geckos, a lot of you've seen that geo, they kind of lift their eyeballs. They don't actually have eyelids. So it's similar to snakes in that way, one of the exceptions to the rule. Um, like they are truly distinct in the sense that they're the more ancient lineages. They had a, they split from other lizards further ago in evolutionary relationships. Does that answer your question? Okay. I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you guys so much. who are currently sitting to come back onto the stage so that we can honor you with a final round of applause.